Welcome back. I'm Jesse Baines with Yahoo Finance Canada. You're watching Editor's Edition. And today we are talking real estate. We've got a budget filled with housing measures, certain types of mortgages going through the roof, and a central bank poised to raise rates to levels we haven't seen in years. All that and more with John Pasalis of Realosophy Realty. He's joining us from Toronto. Thanks for being here, John. Thanks for having me again. And Oakland Realty's Steve Soretsky from Vancouver. Thanks for being here, Steve. Looking forward to it as always. Let's do it. So we're going to get into all of that that I just mentioned, but I'm going to do things a little bit differently this time, and it all makes sense at the end why. But let's start with questions because we have a lot of questions. There's a lot going on uh, in the markets. There's talk about a, a potential slowdown. So let's just get to it. To, for starters, we have Andres. Uh, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, hello, great and insightful show. Thank you. But I still have a question. How do you account for inflation versus interest rates in your predictions in the Vancouver market? I understand the restraints generated by higher interest rates and the logic that will force prices down. Still, in my practice, and he's an architect, uh, uh, works at an architecture firm. Still, in my practice, we're getting quotes for the value of construction per square foot increasing over 60% compared with the previous years. Municipalities are taking ages to approve. There are a shortage of materials and labor. Are we bracing for a crash or a big squeeze? Uh, Steve, I'll let you answer this one since you're the, our expert on the Vancouver market. I mean, it's a really good question. I think that um, it really just depends on can developers or builders pass these costs on to the end user? Do they feel they can pass these on to the end user? Um, I think as it's been over the last 12 to 18 months, they've been able to do that. I think there's a little bit more cautious or, or skepticism that they're going to be able to continue to pass these you know, expensive or rising building costs through to the end user. Uh, we're certainly seeing a pullback in, in demand. I think we're seeing some prices come off a little bit in the suburbs and some of those really hot, frothier markets. So I think if I'm a home builder and developer, I'm kind of like, well, maybe I'm going to hold off a little bit because I don't know what the demand looks like 12 months out from now. Again, like rising costs, uncertainty, you know, the ability to complete a house on time. These are all part of the equation that we have to kind of factor in. So um, do I think that we could see a pullback and say new housing starts? I think that's possible. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's definitely worth bearing, but I think the big thing here is, is, is really, yeah, inflation, rising rates, the ability to pass it on to the end users is all sort of up in the air right now. Hmm. It's interesting times indeed. Okay, the next one comes to us from Neeraj. Neeraj says, I frequently watch your discussions on Yahoo Finance about real estate. And let me tell you that you guys are very good at what you do. They are indeed very good at what they do. And I thank you. It's nice in our business to hear positive feedback like that. So thank you. Uh, I was watch Neeraj says, I was watching a recent video in which John Pasalis mentioned about the price rise being the product of government policy that's been trying to inflate home prices. Okay, so um, let's have a listen to, to that clip. Uh, I know what he's talking about. Have a listen. This rise was not an accident. I mean, th these things just don't happen out of the blue. I mean, this is really a product of government policy uh, that has been trying to inflate home prices. Pre-COVID, they were doing that and they've leaned on it even more. Okay, so he says, I would call myself slightly unqualified um, or novice when it comes to really understanding this. So can you please elaborate for me what it means in terms of government policies and the above point that John Pasalis described in the video? I appreciate if you could help me understand. So John, uh, if you could reiterate, uh, clarify what you mean when you say that. Okay, <laughs> it's a good question. I mean, it's a difficult one to unpack, but I'll try to kind of give two main examples. I mean, the first is certainly, um, you know, our, our federal government uh, is, is ramping up our population growth well ahead of what it was, you know, in the Harper government and previous administrations. And they know that housing completions can't keep up, right? And, you know, when we talk about sort of the supply demand imbalance, I mean, part of it is we know if you're gonna ramp up your population growth by 40%, you know, we were growing by about 350,000 people per year, one of the high, half a million, well, if you can't build homes fast enough, you are deliberately trying to drive home prices up. So that's kind of just one example at the federal level. But when we think about the central bank, you know, when, when COVID hit, 
price, you know, the rates fell. Tiff Macklin, Bank of Canada governor, specifically said they're leaning on housing. You know, when when people were concerned about a bubble in, in a year ago, the response was, you know, we'll take all the growth that we can get. You know, the part of the policy of driving rates down was to actually stimulate the housing market. So it's not just the federal government. The Bank of Canada has leaned on rising home prices to stimulate our economy. And this has been a trend for years. You know, this idea that rising home prices we're leaning on that as the driver of economy. People take up money from their HELOCs, they buy stuff. And, and it's really one of the reasons why house prices in Canada have outpaced so many other countries because we're, we're really dependent on rising home prices to stimulate our economy. Right, and we've looked at charts uh, on, on this show in the past showing how um, you know housing is overtaken in terms of the chunk of our economy use things like research and development and investment in machinery and and things like that and it is a very complicated thing uh, as you mentioned immigration um the prime minister just yesterday was saying that you know part of the problem is that we've had rapid immigration but he almost kind of threw the ball back to the court of the municipalities to build more housing so uh i guess there are a lot of cooks in the kitchen and it's 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 it's, it's a tough nut to crack um Neeraj has a follow-up question Neeraj asks um i also want to know what do you foresee with regard to the house prices in the near future. Just wondering if the prices will keep soaring or stabilize. So let's break this up. John, I'll let you talk about uh, your backyard, the GTA. What do you think? I mean, we keep hearing about a slowdown, fewer offers, but what does that look like? Is that a stabilization? Uh, do they keep rising or something else entirely? What do you think? It's a, I mean, it's a great question. So right now the market is very confusing for a lot of buyers because you have the amazing homes still selling for crazy prices. You have some homes selling for what's market value, you'd think. And then you have other homes selling for, you know, hundred grand less than what they would have sold for two months ago. Uh, so right now the market I'd say is on average stabilizing, but if it continues to slow down, I mean, you might see some downward pressure on prices. I mean, I, no one really kind of predicted that. I certainly didn't, but no one predicted five-year mortgage rates would be at 4% right now. And I think that's potentially going to have a very big impact on people's affordability. So I suspect over the next six to nine months, we're actually going to probably see either some stability or some slight downward pressure. Like we're not going to see a 30% decline, but certainly when there are fewer offers, fewer bidders, homes are going to sell for a little bit less than when there were 15 and 20 offers on homes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and even as you say, we're not going to see a 30% decline. I mean, if we did get that 30% decline, we have, you know, first time buyers sort of frothing on the sidelines, waiting for their opportunity. Um, but 30% is just going to get us back to not even pre COVID <laughs> levels, like it's just a few months yeah. ago, depending on what, how, how you look at it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, unfortunate news uh, for first time buyers, the continued uh, long suffering first time buyers in this country. Uh, Steve, what about in the Vancouver area? Uh, are you, I know, you know, we've, this has come up. Uh, many times during our discussions is the way the GTA mirrors uh, Vancouver. So do you see a similar th sort of situation playing out in terms of prices? Because that's the thing that everybody wants to know about, you know, what's going to happen with prices? Yeah, I think we're in, I think the market's in price discovery mode right now. I think that like John said, there's still the occasional house you see, and you go, oh, that's a really big price. Like, do, do they not realize the market's kind of shifting? So you're still seeing some of that. And then you're seeing a lot of things where, you know, I, I would argue, you know, some of these detached houses in the suburbs, um, buyers today are probably paying, you know, $100,000, $125,000 less than what they would have paid, you know, six to eight weeks ago. So I think there's there's already some price discounting. We've seen examples. Again, I think most of the correction that you're seeing in, in prices is, is actually in the suburban markets where most of the froth was. So, you know, we've seen examples over the last couple of weeks where if you go back to sort of the peak of the market, you know, mid-February sort of thing, you look at some of these townhouses in, in a complex that were maybe selling for nine hundred thousand dollars, which were huge numbers. You know, places that were listed at like seven ninety nine going for in the nines, the same units are coming on like right next door in the same complex, and they're being listed at seven ninety nine with no offer dates. And two weeks later, they're still available. And so, what are they going to sell for? Seven eighty, seven eighty five. So, you know, we're we're seeing price discounting already in parts of the really frothy markets. Right. So question for you, Steve, when you see um, houses coming, uh, you know, that it looks like they're not going to get what they want 
in terms of price. Are you finding, are you seeing, expecting that some buyers are just going to pull their house off the market and wait for something to change? And maybe, you know, if there are buyers, uh, sorry, sellers, if there are sellers like that who are pulling their houses off the market, waiting for something better, uh, could they end up in a situation that's actually even worse? Yeah, I think that's a real scenario. I mean, if if I still think if mortgage rates stay where they are today, which is you know basically four percent, I think we're going to see prices correct. And I don't know if that's just five percent or if that's something greater than that. But um, that, that's that's my view. I think affordability is a huge challenge right now. We've had a huge run up in prices, and now you throw on you know mortgage rates that have moved from about two and a half percent to four percent in like six or seven weeks. I mean, that's a massive move, and so. Just kind of a bit of a shock in the market right now and there's a lot of buyers that are like mm, maybe i should like wait this out i mean it's, it's kind of a tough dilemma because they're looking at it and saying oh, listen i've got a mortgage rate hold today that expires in you know 45 days and i've got a mortgage rate at 3.2 percent i got to use it in 45 days otherwise it expires and my new rate's going to be 4.2 percent and is the price going to come down enough to offset that new mortgage cost and so that's kind of the, the, the question that a lot of home buyers seem to be asking, at least when they're you know chatting with me. That's the that's a lot of the conversation right now. And so I think demand is is somewhat kind of paralyzed right now. So and uh, just to keep on this topic a little bit, Steve. Um, so you're referring to four percent in the fixed uh, mortgage space, right? Um, so are enough buyers out there just completely disregarding fixed fixed mortgages and and just um, thinking them everything, all their budgeting is done uh, through the variable mortgage and the fixed rate just doesn't much matter. I know that the banks like to push fixed rates um, on consumers uh, for a variety of reasons. But if you're not listening to uh, the, the, the bank when they're calling you to, to lock into fix and you're looking at variable rates, does the fixed rates even much matter? <laughs> and I'd love to hear John's thoughts on this, but you know, basically <laughs> what I'm seeing is so you've got your variable today still at about two. Obviously, the Bank of Canada is probably going to raise rates tomorrow, maybe 50 basis. Like your variable is going up. I mean, it's probably going to get to two and a half percent here pretty quickly. But the funny thing is the conversation that I'm having, it seems like everybody is kind of, I think, making arguably the wrong decision, which is everybody's panicking into locking in five year fixed rates at four percent. Um, so I, I think the messaging and the media out there and, and the bank economists and everyone's going, oh my gosh, inflation, rates are going up, you know, 4% turns into 5%, turns into 6%. And it seems like people are actually panicking and locking in and opting to go on the fixed side of things. And again, I still think there's a huge discount. I still think that expectations for rate hikes are, are way too high. I mean, eight rate hikes this year, I think is, I don't think it's going to happen, but yeah, I think people are panicking into fixed rates at high levels, in my opinion. Interesting. Uh, just a quick programming note. We are recording this before the Bank of Canada, widely expected to raise 50 basis points, but uh, we shall see. It's what it's a, call, a supersized rate hike it's being called. And <laughs> I know you, you, you've you referred to the, but we'll get into it later, but Steve, I think you believe you, uh, you called some parts of the budget a, a nothing burger. So it's like the McDonald's uh, themed housing market these days with nothing burgers supersized um okay so john steve said he, he'd like to hear what you have to say so i would as well what what do you have to say about that yeah i mean i agree with steve i mean i think it's interesting to see buyers rushing in at four percent i mean i wouldn't be rushing in at four percent i mean you gotta imagine it also impacts what they can borrow because you're, you're getting stress tested effectively at what you know 200 basis like two full percentage choice above that so you're kind of usually better off uh, I'd be going variable right now. Like I cannot see variable hitting 4% anytime soon anyway. So uh, you're going to be probably in a better position if you go variable. And and even knowing that rates are going to be going up, you know, at least, you know, uh, 50 to 100 basis points over the next little while. I, I agree with Steve. I'd probably be going variable right now. Yeah. And then there's a bunch of mortgage calculators out there online. So, you know, crunch some numbers and see what it would take. And it's going to take quite a few rate hikes to get to close that gap. And uh, as Steve says, um, you know, if it's something like eight rate hikes, uh, we'll see if, if, if that's actually gonna happen. Um, okay, let's move on. This one comes to us from Jason. Jason asks, "What? If, here's an idea. What if the government introduced a tax 
on a sale price that goes over over and above the asking price. So make it a 50% penalty to the seller on all dollars over ask. Maybe we'd get back to a more reasonable bidding process versus blind bidding. Uh, what do you think about that, uh, John? Never going to happen. I mean, are you going to tax? No, never going to happen. I mean, the, the ask, people I think are missing the point. Like it, it's like an auction. I mean, people want transparency. Like, ima like it's, imagine like the asking price is just like listing it for a dollar and letting the market decide. Like it's kind of an irrelevant price, right? And people are stuck on this idea that the asking price is meaningful, at least, you know, when we have tons of offers, but it's, it's a meaningless price. They may as well just list it for a dollar. Uh, so no, you can't, you can't tax someone's gains. I mean, I mean, at least not without kind of really impacting your ability to get reelected in Canada. I mean, cause as capital gains are tax free. So I, I don't think that's necessarily a, a solution. And listen, they talked about ending blind bidding. My feeling is it's probably, we were just talking about this coincidentally today with our agents. My instinct is it's actually probably going to make the market more competitive and probably drive like what, what getting rid of blind bidding gets away with is this, eight, you know, the one buyer who way overpays, uh, but it, it creates a lot more anxiety real time if it's an auction scenario. So I don't necessarily think it's going to be the result of any massive affordability solution. It's probably just going to keep prices elevated. I don't think it's going to make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. I just imagine fam, you know, couples at auctions with their paddles and, uh, the one part, one spouse wants that house real bad and keeps nudging the partner like go and then like just the competitive fire comes in and you know it's like okay five million to the gentleman in the front who's getting poked by his wife to <laughs> make this house that's happen. A, and that's the thing and in an auction it's real time right like and there's nothing holding you back you just throw money at it whereas the way things are now you have to stop you have to think about it you have 30 minutes to decide you got to revise your offer but when it's real time, it's really easy to keep throwing an extra five or 10 grand at something if you really want it. Can I just chime in there? Yes, please yeah. do. Well, yeah, I mean, like how many, how many taxes and new policies have we brought into the housing market in like BC and Ontario over the last like three, four years? I mean, like last time I checked, you had record price growth, you know, over the last 18 to 24 months. And it's only now that mortgage rates are getting to four and we're starting to see a slowdown. So, you know, to, to kind of John's point, it's like, these like fake teaser listing prices. I mean, good luck with that strategy in two or three months from now. I mean, it's, it's already starting to not work. So I think the market ebbs and flows. I know that people want more transparency and open bidding process, but you know, all I do is I always say like, look at Australia, they've got an auction style. Last time I checked their house prices are equally as bad or worse than Canada's. So, um, you know, Okay, uh, let's move on to Aliyah. Aliyah asks, um, and this one's for John because this is in his neck of the woods. Is it possible to let me know about selling a semi-detached in the Malton area, if now is a good time, since I missed the bidding war? Uh, I guess her situation depends, right, John? We don't know if uh, she's bid on a house that's going to close and you know what her exact deal is, but what, what would be your message to her? I mean, if you, I mean, it's hard to time the market. Like I, I you know, sell, if you want to sell, if you want to move on, like the market's still a seller's market. You know, I think there's a lot of talk about this slowdown. And I think too, some sellers are panicking too quickly. Like at the end of the day, it's still a seller's market. You know, we missed, you may have missed the period where every single home is getting 15 offers. Um, but homes are still selling for decent prices as long as sellers are patient. The ones that are selling for below what they should are generally sellers who are anxious, who've already bought and who needs to sell. Uh, but the ones that are patient are still doing okay. So what do you think about that strategy, John, buying before or selling before you buy, buying before you sell? What's the right way? Uh, I, I know you can't always time it exactly the way you want to, but what, what should come first? It's like a chicken and the chicken or the egg kind of situation when it comes to real estate. What's your view? I mean, I'm highly risk averse, so I normally would sell first, but that is not the norm. Like 95% of people in Toronto would buy first and then sell. Uh, and to be honest, most of the time it's the right approach. Uh, the market's pretty busy. It's hard to find a home. Houses sell quickly. You know, th these are the periods where it starts becoming a little bit more questionable because 
when the market, when the momentum is slowing, you got to imagine you're buying in a busy period. And by the time you sell, you're selling in potentially a slower market, right? Um, and that's why if you're going to buy and then sell, you got to list your home like within a week. You don't want to wait four weeks because the market could be very, we've seen how the market is turned already in four weeks. So, uh, you know, you got to mitigate your risk, get a long closing and basically list right away. Yeah, she's she's a fickle one, fickle one that market. Um, okay, let's move on to Sunil. Sunil wants to know. Um, let's give this one to Steve because I know he's uh, talked up Alberta a little bit. But I'm planning to buy a single family home, so just looking for the market, and it would be a great help if I could get some idea. Will the housing market in Canada, especially in Alberta and Ontario, cool down in the near future? So let's start with Alberta, um, Steve. Uh, I know you've talked about Calgary as a, as a you know good destination uh, for somebody looking to buy a home, but do you? Uh, I know it's heated up a little bit. I'm not sure. I'm not too up to, to speed on on the sort of the numbers, but uh, do you expect Calgary, uh, Alberta, Edmonton to to slow a little bit too, the way we're seeing uh, in Ontario and BC? Yeah, this is maybe like, you know, I'm not exactly the expert per se, but I do think I look at like Calgary market. I think there's like less, there's about a month of inventory, I think for single family houses. So it's a like really tight market. It's not, it's not something that people in Calgary are used to, but they are getting a lot of capital from Vancouver and Toronto that's pouring into that market. And if you look at affordability metrics, it's like still one of the most affordable metrics in Canada. I think affordability metrics are better today than they, they were like, you know, eight or nine or 10 years ago. So I think I ultimately, yeah, could 4% mortgages slow, slow it down. Sure. But like, I, I'm more concerned about price valuations and market corrections in some of the frothier markets in like the suburbs of Vancouver, the suburbs of Ontario, where you've seen prices almost double in three years. That's already a very highly levered market. And now you tack on like rising mortgage rates. I think that those are the markets in my opinion that are kind of ripe for corrections. I think like, you know, Calgary, Edmonton, I mean, those markets are so cheap already. Like, you know, what, what are they going to crack? Like a house goes from 500 to 485. Like, I, I just don't get too concerned about that. Okay. Uh, now let's move on to Sino Ammo. This comes to us by way of Twitter. And the question here is, hey, Steve. What do you think of the probability of pre-sales being underwater when the project is completed? This is one that's coming up a lot. So I'm looking to buy a two bedroom low rise in Langley and I'm quoted 800,000 completion being in 2025. Thanks in advance for all that you are doing. Thank you, Steve. It's a lot of money for Langley. Um... I think it always depends on 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 the project, right? Like the, the first question we've talked about in the show, I'd be asking who is the developer? Are they reputable? They're actually going to complete the project if if the market turns south. Um, what's the deposit structure? I mean, you know, in Langley, I don't think I'd be putting down twenty percent deposit. I think that's way too much for that market. Um, I, don't, I don't know the square footage of that unit. I don't know if it's a high rise or if it's a low rise wood frame. But all I can say is pre-sales in general pre-sales in general today are for the most part fully priced i think they're they're baking in a lot of future price expectations i think the pre-sale pricing today is optimistic about the future of the housing market um so i would be a little bit cautious on the pre-sale side now don't get me wrong there's still some pre-sales out there that i do like and that i would say you're fine but as a whole i think that there's been better times to buy pre-sales Okay, uh, that is all of your questions for this show. Uh, let's move on now to the budget. A bit of a, a follow up to some of the announcements we got. None of the big blockbusters that we've talked about uh, on this show, like uh, in my view, though, the one raising the CMHC limit from a million to 1.25 could have been a big one. Um, any sort of taxes on investors. Uh, could a larger tax could have been a bigger one, you know, not being able to use your HELOC. So it was a lot of the stuff that we expected. I think uh, the marquee being the foreign buyers tax. Uh, we're going to listen to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau uh, the, the day after uh, the, the budget was released. He's uh, talk, make, it's a, at an affordable housing 
uh, announcement. But before we hear what he has to say, I just want to remind everybody that prices have, in fact, more than doubled under his watch. Um, but let's have a listen to what he had to say, and then I'll get you guys to weigh in. Have a listen. When foreign investors and corporations use housing as an asset, it drives prices higher and higher and makes homes out of reach of the middle class. Homes are to live in, to raise a family in, to build a life in, not a way to boost the balance sheet. So, uh, like John, I see you're you're sort of chuckling there. What what do you uh, what what goes through your mind when you hear him say that? And what's sort of like your overall uh, view of those measures that were announced and what they'll do for affordability? If anything, I mean, I I think my view is probably the one that's shared with a lot of people who are trying to buy a home, which is like just exhausted of hearing these stories because it's it's like they've been in the government, you know, since what twenty fifteen. As he said, house prices have doubled, um, and the reality is they didn't do anything. Like they're not they're not getting rid of corporations buying homes. They've they've kind of indicated they might just might tax them. You know, um, they're not really doing anything about foreign buyers. I mean, a lot of the the policies they put in place have so many loopholes. So the, they're really not doing anything on on the housing front. I mean, they make a lot of promises. They've been promising a lot since 2015, uh, but as you said, house prices have doubled, and I think a lot of people you know, kind of hear a lot of this talk and are, and are just kind of not buying it anymore because nothing's been done in how, you know, seven years. So anyways, I think it's, and I, and I think the budget was a bit disappointing for a lot of people because not, there's nothing really meaningful in that that's going to have any material impact. Okay, Steve, what is your takeaway? <laughs> well, I just want to mention, because I think there's uh, some misunderstanding because every you know, media headline picked it up, foreign buyer ban. But if you actually read the budget, so a lot of the housing policies that were brought in or proposed here actually have timelines and specific dates that are going to be introduced. The foreign buyer ban, as per the budget, says their words, not mine. We, quote, intend to propose restrictions. We intend to propose restrictions. So there's not actually any firm dates or timelines. It's just, it's an intention to make a proposal. So this is actually going to get approved through Parliament. I, I, I don't know if this policy will actually ever see the light of day. Interesting. Okay, I want to turn to another um, politician who's uh, getting a lot of attention, uh, generating a lot of energy on this file, and that's Pierre Polyev. He's running to be the leader of the Conservatives. He put out a video that's being widely shared, standing in front of a run down Vancouver home, which is four point something million dollars today. And, you know, he says it's something that a typical family could have afforded to live in a couple in, you know, decade, if only a few decades ago. Uh, he's really hitting the housing file hard. Let's have a listen to, to this, uh, what he had to say in this video about his plan. Uh, well, a Polyev government will stop the central bank from printing cash for politicians to spend and the wealthy to borrow. That will deal with some of the over demand. But on the supply side, a Polyev government would require municipalities like Vancouver speed up building permits and reduce the governmental cost associated with building things. My message to City Hall here in Vancouver is remove the gatekeepers. Stop blocking the poor, the working class, and our immigrants from the privilege of owning a home here in this country. It used to be a right, and it should be again. So, uh, John, real quick, uh, we're come, running against the clock here, but do you think this sort of messaging could be the thing that, you know, helps Pierre Polyev become the next Prime Minister of Canada someday? A hundred percent. I mean, it, and I think even if the policies themselves he's proposing aren't a solution, I think people are, I think are tired of the Liberals. I think, you know, Pierre's a great communicator. I think his message is resonating with people. Um, you know, and, and people are just are, are more hopeful that he's actually going to address this issue. So I do think uh, that, you know, his message and his style is certainly resonating with, with voters that have been uh, priced out of the housing market. Okay. And Steve Sretsky, what is your uh, view on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, like I said, love him or hate him, I think his message is clear and concise. He's getting through to to the audience that, you know, he's he's looking for. And, you know, I've had a few chats with him and I think he's, I think he means well, he's pointing out a lot of the, the obvious problems. Um, I think he's doing a great job in, in opposition here. 
Um, obviously, I, I still think a lot of these problems are very, very large problems that I'm skeptical one person can fix, but I, I think he is certainly beating the right drum. And I think that, you know, if you pull a lot of millennials, I think it's actually resonating with them, uh, which is probably not typical for a conservative party leader. Absolutely. Okay, that brings us to the end of this show, and it brings us to the end of this series. This is be our last show. Uh, we have certainly enjoyed these discussions. We've, uh, you have all learned a lot. I've learned a, a lot. Um, thank you so much, John Pasalis, for being with us yeah. during the Thanks for twenty yeah, it's been, it, plus episodes. It's been a blast. Yeah, it has indeed. And thank you so much, Steve Sretsky. Jesse, I'm going to miss you dearly, my friend. Thanks for, uh, <laughs> thank you. I'm going, thanks for having I'm me on. This has been awesome. Yes, it has. Um, you know, and thank you to everybody that sent all your questions in. We have answered. I don't, I've lost count. Uh, there's uh, a lot to learn from you two. Uh, it's been great. Um, you know, uh, be sure to, uh, I'm moving on to new adventures, but in the meanwhile, be sure to check out John and Steve on Twitter. They will continue to have all kinds of information, insights, stats to the housing markets. Hit them up with your questions there. Meanwhile, do check back in at Yahoo Finance Canada for lots of stories about real estate, the economy, stock markets, all that and more. Thanks so much for watching.